I write this sitting in the kitchen sink. That is, my feet are in it. The rest of me is on the draining board, which I have padded with our dog's blanket and the tea cozy. I can't say that I'm really comfortable, and there's a depressing smell of carbolic soap, but this is the only part of the kitchen where there is any daylight left. And I have found that sitting in a place where you've never sat before can be inspiring. I wrote my very best poem while sitting on the hen house. Though even that isn't a very good poem, I've decided my poetry is so bad I mustn't write any more of it. Drips from the roof are plopping into the water butt by the back door. The view through the windows above the sink is excessively drear. Beyond the dank garden in the courtyard and are the ruined walls on the edge of the moat. Beyond the moat, the boggy ploughed fields stretch to the leaden sky. I tell myself that all the rain we've had lately is good for nature and that at any moment spring will surge on us. I try to see leaves on the trees in the courtyard filled with sunlight. Unfortunately, the more my mind's eye sees green and gold, the more drained of all colour does the twilight seem. It is comforting to look away from the windows and towards the kitchen fire, near which my sister Rose is ironing, though she obviously can't see properly, and it will be a pity if she scorches her only nightgown. I have two, but one is mine as it's behind. Rose looks particularly fetching by firelight because she is a pinkish gold, very light and feathery. Although I'm rather used to her, I know she is a beauty. She's nearly 21 and very bitter with life. I'm 17, look younger, feel older. I'm no beauty, but have a neatish face. I've just remarked to Rose that our situation is really rather romantic, two girls in this strange and lonely house. She replied that she saw nothing romantic about being shut up in a crumbling ruin surrounded by a sea of mud. I must admit that our home is an unreasonable place to live in, yet I love it. The house itself was built in the time of Charles II, but it was damaged by Cromwell. The whole of our east wall was part of the castle. There are two round towers in it. The gatehouse is intact, and a stretch of the old walls at their full height joins it to the house. And Belmont Tower, all that remains of an even older castle, still stands on its mound close by. But I won't attempt to describe our peculiar house fully until I can see more time ahead of me than I do now. I'm writing this journal partly to practice my newly acquired speed writing and partly to teach myself how to write a novel. I intend to capture all our characters and put in conversations. It ought to be good for my style to dash along without much thought, as up to now my stories have been very stiff and self-conscious. The only time Father obliged me by reading one of them, he said that I combined stateliness with a desperate effort to be funny. He told me to relax and let the words flow out of me. I wish I knew a way to make words flow out of Father. Years and years ago, he wrote a very unusual book called Jacob Wrestling, a, mi a mixture of fiction, philosophy, and poetry. It was a great success, particularly in America, where he made a lot of money by lecturing on it, and he seemed likely to become a very important writer indeed. But he stopped writing. Mother believed this was due to something that happened when I was about five. We were living in a small house by the sea at the time. Father had just joined us after his second American lecture tour. One afternoon when we were having tea in the garden, he had the misfortune to lose his temper with mother, very noisily, just as he was about to cut a piece of cake. He brandished the cake knife at her so menacingly that an officious neighbor jumped the garden fence to intervene and got himself knocked down. Father explained in court that killing a woman with our silver cake knife would be a long, weary business entailing sawing her to death, and he was completely exonerated of any intention of slaying mother. The whole case seems to have been quite ludicrous with everyone but the neighbor being very funny. But father made the mistake of being funnier than the judge. <clears throat> and as there was no doubt whatever that he had seriously damaged the neighbor, he was sent to prison for three months. When he came out, he was as nice a man as ever. Nicer, really, because his temper was so much better. Apart from that, he didn't seem to me to be changed at all. But Rose remembers that he'd already begun to get unsociable. It was then that he took a 40 years lease of, of the castle, which is an admirable place to be unsociable in. Once we were settled here, he was supposed to begin a new book. But time went on without anything happening, and at last we realized that he'd given up even trying to write. For years now, he's refused to discuss the possibility. Most of his life is spent in the gatehouse room, which is icy cold in winter, as there is no fireplace. He just huddles over an oil stove. As far as we know, he does nothing but read detective novels from the village library. Miss Marcy, the librarian and schoolmistress, brings them to him. She admires him greatly and says, the iron has entered his soul. Personally, I can't see how the iron could get very far into a man's soul during only three months in jail. Anyway, not if the man has as much vitality as father had, and he seemed to have plenty of it left when they let him out. But it has gone now, and his unsociability has grown almost into a disease. I often think he would prefer not even to meet his own household. All his natural gaiety has vanished. At times he puts on a false cheerfulness that embarrasses me. But usually he's either morose or irritable. I think I should prefer it if, he's, if he lost his temper as he used to. 
Oh, poor father, he really is very pathetic, but he might at least do a little work in the garden. I'm aware that this isn't a fair portrait of him. I must capture him later. Thanks very much.